Good morning, everybody. I got a good morning back. That was good. That was good. Here's the, uh, the opening question for the morning. I often open with some kind of question to try to get you to engage with what's happening here. And it works okay. And here's, the, here's the one. How often do we swear? And by swear, by the way, the, probably the first thing that came to your head was like certain kinds of words, like we say swear words. I'm not actually referring to swear words. That's not actually what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about language that we call swear words. I mean, how often do we say, I swear, or make an oath, or something to that extent? Some, some version of it. I try to brainstorm some of the reasons that we swear things. I'll start with the habit. Um, this is not on my slide, but I, I have talked with people that say, I swear to God, so frequently, I think within a three-minute conversation, they probably say it ten times. You know, these, the folks are just like, they're constantly saying the phrase, I swear to God. Um... This is not on my slide because this isn't really in the sense of they're actually meaning to swear something. It's become so habitual in their speech pattern that it's just something that they say. It's not really an oath issue. It is a taking God's name in vain issue, which is not what this sermon is about. If you struggle with that particular speech pattern, I just want you to know that God has made it clear he doesn't like it. If, if you struggle with constantly saying, I swear to God, and you don't actually mean it, you're not actually talking about a God, you just say that because that's what comes out of your mouth. I just want you to know God doesn't like that. I suggest, if you would like to change that habit, to find a friend or two that can help you notice when you do it and give you some kind of high sign. You're doing it again. Really, I'm not trying to bust anybody down. I have some bad speech habits too. I'm just trying to give us some practical advice. If you struggle with this one, try to find somebody that can help you notice when you say it and cut back on that. But that isn't really what this sermon is about. I want to talk about when we swear or something similar and we mean it. I've got a slide for that. Some of the basic answers to that question. If... Lauren figures it out. There we go. There's some, some of the times in our lives that we swear. One of them is the solemn oath. This happens pretty infrequently in our lives. Some people have never made one. If you've never been married, um, you may have gone your whole life and never made a solemn oath. This is the sort of thing that you say at a wedding or uh, if you go to court and there's a judge and you have to testify or if you're taking a um, public position and you, you're, you make some sort of vow that you will um, do certain things. You have to do this in the military when you join. Um, these are O's. They don't happen very often. They're infrequent. Uh, and oftentimes we kind of celebrate these. These are ones that we don't look down on as being flippant, certainly. People take these kinds of things pretty serious. But they are a way that we make an oath. The second type is the, what I'm going to call the proof statement. This is when, uh, it happens when we're fishing, you know. It really was this big, I swear. You know, it's, it's when we think no one's going to believe us. Uh, and so we, we add the little I swear bit specifically to try to get people to believe this unbelievable thing. So we've experienced something that we don't think other people are going to get, and we throw I swear in as kind of an extra push to try to get people to believe that. Then we have what I would call the, the negative swears. Those first two were, were typically not upset, or this, there's typically not a lot of negative emotion going on, but with these last four, there's often some sort of conflict brewing in the midst of it. The ultimatum, I swear if you ever do that again, I'm leaving you. I swear that if that ever happens again, you're going to be grounded for a year. Uh, whatever the thing is, the ultimatum. 
the, uh, the vengeance. I swear I will make you pay. Why do we do that one? That's kind of a self-assurance one. The, the ultimatum one is an effort to control. The whole, I swear if you do that again, it means that we've, we've kind of feel like we've lost control and now we're trying to take control, so we make this oath to try to take control. And the, the vengeance one is kind of a self-assurance one. I can't get you back yet. I really want to hurt you now. I really want to take something out on you now, but I can't do it now. It's impossible for me to do it now. And so I'm going to pacify myself by promising to myself that I'm going to someday get it. And that way I can relax a little bit because I'm so angry. Then there's maybe the, the plea for forgiveness. The repentance swear. I swear I will never do it again. Some of you have probably said this before. The problem with this one is we rarely keep it. This is, this is not one we keep very often, sadly. We, we make this oath. We plan to keep it. We want to keep it. And oftentimes the person we're talking to wants to hear us say it. But even though that's true, we're not actually saying something that's very valuable. And then there's the denial swear, the effort to avoid guilt. I swear I didn't do it. Now, if you go to the next slide, those last four, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, for many of us, this is where we're most likely to, to, to swear something. For many, I'm not saying everybody, not everybody has the same speech patterns, not everybody has the same habits. I would say, though, for many people in the world where we've reached an emotional point where regardless of what we would normally swear, now suddenly we're willing to swear, it's probably in one of those last four categories. Why am I talking about this? Well, it's going to wrap back around, I promise, because we're going to talk about swearing today. And we're going to talk about swearing ultimately in a context that we may not expect and so I wanted to help us understand and get an idea of when do we really struggle with making an oath? When, when are we most tempted to make an oath? And kind of, kind of look at that square in the eye because that isn't something I think we often think about. I don't know that I've ever been asked that question personally. I don't know that I've ever really considered that part of my life and how it relates. But it's going to be important today that we do that. So I'm introducing this idea so we're ready for it later. Now going into James chapter 5, though. That's where we're at. We're in James chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, or then it's towards the end. And if you don't have a Bible, then you don't care because you have some phone or something and it'll get there instantly. So it'll be easy. James chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 9. We're going to go through verse 12. We're nearing the end of James's letter. James has had to address some pretty tough issues and the way that people are treating each other in this letter. In chapter 2, James had to address how the rich were mistreating the poor and their lack of generosity. In chapter 3, he had to tackle boasting and cursing and things that they were saying to each other that were inappropriate. Chapter 4, he mentioned quarreling, fighting, and bickering for selfish reasons. It's clear that the members of the church are not treating each other as well as they should, and that comes up all the way through this letter. This is, this is clearly a theme of, of James is trying to help them wrestle with, you're the church, you're new Christians, you're, you're the body of Christ, and you're not treating each other as well as you should. So it's in that context that we read now, he's at the, towards the end of his letter, and he's going to write some things about generally some of these topics. This is James chapter 5. I'm going to read 9 through 12. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. 
But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. You may not know why I included chapter tw- or verse 12 with the rest of it. It kind of seems to be a different topic. We're going to get to that because I think they actually relate. But let's dive in, first of all, to verse 9. This is one of those passages where if we got verse 9, we probably wouldn't need to get the rest of it. Verse 9, if we understand verse 9, it actually has everything we need to know about the topic. He starts with, don't complain against each other. The rest of the letter that he's already written has made it clear they have plenty of reasons to complain. Right? Right? They've been treating each other badly. There has been bad treatment of each other in this letter. So it isn't that he is saying there's no reason for you to complain. He's saying don't. Those are not the same things. He's saying don't do it. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves might not be judged In other words, complaining itself on each other is something that God will judge us for. I do want to make sure that we know that complaining does not equal confronting. And I'm going to have another sermon in a couple weeks where we're going to talk about confronting and how it's different than complaining. But confronting each other biblically in the body of Christ is good. It's difficult, it's hard, and it's uncomfortable, but it is not bad. Confronting is not the same as complaining. And it may seem subtle, but I think most of us deep down do know the difference. I think, I think all of us, most, most of us deep enough know, we know the difference between confronting someone and complaining about someone. Those are not the same. So I want you to understand, it is okay to confront people. In fact, it is more than okay. We need to know how to confront each other. We're going to talk about that in a different sermon. This is talking about complaining against each other. And that's different. And he gives the reason why. He says the judge is at the door. Okay, I I, I tested this out on my kids to see if this analogy worked. They said it worked great, Dad, so here we go. Okay, here's the analogy. Two kids are in a bedroom fighting, right? They don't know mom is watching. Mom is watching. But they don't know. They're just, they're fighting. And as it turns out, mom is at the door. Sees the whole thing. And then the kids realize mom's standing there, right? Okay, how good is it for one of the kids to do this? Did you see what he did, mom? Do you see what he did? Do you see that? Do you see that? He did me. How is that going to work out for him? Not good. That is not good. That is not helpful. You are not helping the situation. Mom saw it. You don't need to explain it. You don't need to plead your case. You don't need to point it out. You don't need to be that kid. Mom saw it. It would be the same thing as if Um, You were committing a crime, and there were witnesses there, and and then you went to court for the crime. Turns out the judge was one of the people there when you committed the crime, and he doesn't need any evidence, and he doesn't need any lawyers. He saw you do it. (laughs) The judge is at the door. God saw the whole thing. God saw the whole thing. He has all the evidence. He has all the facts. He has all the background. He even knows the root motives that every single person in the situation had. God knows what happened. Why are we worried about it and trying to get justice if God saw it? That's his point. That is his point. If we had perfect faith, we would be able to rest in the truth that God will do the right thing. If we had perfect faith, we would know that God could be trusted with handling the outcome. If we had perfect faith, 
we would know that it's God's job to manage justice and to manage mercy and to manage consequences and to manage grace as he sees fit, and it's his job. And if we actually got that as well as we could get it, we wouldn't need any of the rest of what he talks about. (laughs) We would just be done. It would be over. We would no longer struggle with this need to complain against people and be bitter against people and to be hurt against people. If we really understood God is at the door, he saw the whole thing and he will deal with it as he sees fit and we rested in that, it would be life-changing. It would be life changing. It would totally transform the way we react to everything that happened. James knows that we're not going to be very good at that. <laughs> and so he keeps talking. <laughs> and he has a few more things to say. And he has a few more things only because he knows this is hard and we're probably not going to get it right. But if we were able to get verse 9 of chapter 5 of James, it would transform our life forever. Because God's at the door. He, he has justice in his hands. He can handle it. So because we don't do well with this and we don't understand it and we struggle, James is going to give us two examples and an important warning. Two examples and an important warning. Okay? And that's what we're going to look at now is those two examples and that warning. The first example that he gives is from the prophets. It's from the prophets, and this is in verse 10. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. I have to tell you that as I look at all the people in the Bible that got handed various jobs, I feel the most sorry for the prophets. I mean, way cooler to be, say, David, who gets to be king and kill giants and do stuff like that. Or, but the prophets had it rough. They did. One of the main reasons that God called prophets was to point out how people were failing. That's that confronting bit I already talked about. There's a difference between confronting and complaining. And God called prophets to confront people on his behalf. No one likes this. No one likes being confronted. But this is nevertheless the job the prophets had to do. And while not everything the prophets said were how bad they were, there were messages of hope and there were messages of promise, the amount of prophets that had to say, because you were faithful and this good thing will happen, is only a handful compared to the prophets who who had to say, you've been bad and these bad things are going to happen. Those prophets far outweigh the prophets who got the little bit of, woohoo, hey, you've been faithful, something's going to happen. That's pretty small. (laughs) And the amount that it had to say, you have really blown it and a bad thing is going to happen, that was a pretty big pile. And here's the problem. People did not like being told that they were failing. And so these people got to tell everyone how they were failing and then they got to be treated like dirt for being obedient to God. Talk about having the right to complain. And by the way, some of them did on occasion, complain. Now, they complain to God where the complaining belongs. If you're going to complain anywhere, complain to God. It's the least damaging place you can complain. You go complain to someone else, that's a problem. You go especially complain to someone who isn't a Christian about somebody in the body of Christ, you are destroying the body of Christ. It is horribly bad. You go complain to God, it is contained. And if God needs to fix you, he can fix you. But you have not spread ugliness all over the place. You've just dealt with God. Jeremiah did it. I've talked about Jeremiah before. He's the weeping prophet. He got to say a lot of horrible things. You can read it in chapter 12. I'm not going to read you through the entire chapter. But Jeremiah complains bitterly about the people who seem to get away with everything while he suffers. (laughs) But in the end, the job of prophet was really miserable. And the only comfort they had was that God was just. 
because they were not rewarded in this life with riches. They were not rewarded in this life with comfort. They were not rewarded in this life with approval or even respect. And, and look, if you've come from a religious tradition that says if you're doing what God wants you to do, you'll automatically get riches and reward and respect and privilege and approval. I just need you to go back and look at Jeremiah's life because that guy was faithful to the end and he got nothing except dismal rejection and hatred. So it is not a guarantee that if you're doing what God wants you to do that you're going to get all the fluffy bunny stuff and it's going to be yay. That's not a guarantee. They were rewarded with loneliness and rejection and hatred. But knowing far more clearly than most (laughs) that God was the judge. That he was the Lord Almighty. And knowing far more than most that he was at the door. In fact, they frequently say that very phrase, he is at the door. Where was the small bit of comfort that the prophets had the trust and realization that though they lived in utter hell sometimes, God was at the door and he was just and he had the end. That's all they had. James is saying if the prophets could live with their pain and have to just rest that God had the end and it belonged with him and I can live my life in whatever circumstances if it means that I know that God's in control, I can do it. If they could do it, you could do it. That's his, that's his example. If, if, if the prophets can do it, you can do it. You know that's what they had to go through. You know that we respect them today. We know that today we can look back and see that they were faithful and see that God used them and see that the power of their words resonates all the way to now. We can see that. We can see that God must be so pleased with them. We must know that their reward in heaven is great. But the truth is, their time on this earth was pretty yucky. So don't complain. Put your faith that God is at the door. So that's his first example. His first example of not complaining, of of trusting God's judgment are the prophets. And it's a really good example. His second example is Job. And with Job, we might not pick up on what he's trying to say if we're not good students of the book of Job. It's easy to miss what James is trying to say. I'll read that passage, verse 11. Behold, we count those blessed who endure. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Now, when we think of Job... I think many people think about what God did to Job that Job had to endure. I don't think that's what James is referring to. Have any of you tried to read Job? What is it full of? People complaining against each other. It is countless pages 40 chapters of people complaining against each other, if you've actually read the book. What is the topic in verse 9? Do not complain, brethren, against one another. That is all Job is. It's is just countless line upon line. It is mind-numbing. Look, I, I struggle with reading Job and not just starting to not pay attention to the actual words and just kind of, it all becomes just this massive kind of whine. It's, it is hard to actually concentrate on everything in the book. It is endless repetition of complaint. And the weird thing about the complaint in Job is Job's friends are complaining about something Job can't can even control. They're complaining that somehow Job must be at fault. This is a lot of what his friends get to say to him. Job looks like you're miserable and sick. And everything died. What the heck did you do? Why do you deserve this? Your life is horrible. You must suck. That's their complaint. 
They're complaining at him because they're tired of his misery. And they're blaming him for his mercy, misery, get it all over them. <laughs> and Job has to handle this. Job has to absorb it. It isn't, Job's misery isn't just the, the bad things that God allowed to happen to Job. Job's misery is in the midst of enduring the bad things that God allowed to happen, everybody else's criticism of him in the middle of it when he hasn't done anything wrong. It, it is double whammy. It's from God that he feels rejected and he can't get it and he doesn't know why he's suddenly cursed. And then it's from all of his friends who are calling him a, an evil person because this stuff happens. It is a book of complaint. I want to read to you how Job ends, though, because it's not the way many of us would maybe want it to end. This is Job 42, verses 7 and 8. 42 chapters of complaining. Here we are in verse 7 and 8. And it came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job. This is after... God's revealed himself to Job and now Job's seeing him and Job's had this amazing conversation with God and now God's saying, he's kind of closing everything up. Verse, verse 7, The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. The judge was at the door. God saw everything. Nothing that was said was hidden. Nobody, Job didn't have to tell on his friends. God was there. He saw it. And his wrath was kindled against them as he watched them treat his servant this way in the middle of his crisis. Verse 8. Now therefore, take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job will pray for you for I will accept him so that I may not do with you according to your folly because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. What happens? The very people who were guilty as anything of treating Job like garbage, God says, but I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to restore you and I'm not going to take it out of you. Oh, and I'm going to do it through Job. I'm going to do it through the very guy who had to endure your pain. Who had to endure your argument, who had to endure your rudeness, who had to endure all of that. I'm going to redeem you through the person who suffered. Whoa. Do you think Job wanted that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether Job was like, really? Can you just smite him instead? I, I would sort of enjoy seeing the smiting. They treated me horrible. Why, do I have to pray for them? Do I have to say, yes, God, restore them and don't take it? Do I have to do that? You see, we in our selfish humanness, we always want God to smack the people we're upset with. And you know what? Because we're human and we sin, we want God to smack them for stuff they really did. They're like, this isn't imaginary. This isn't made up stuff. They really did stuff. They are genuinely guilty. And But God is a God who's rich in mercy. God is a God who's rich in restoration. God is a God who forgives those who do not deserve forgiveness. And if we shut them down in their complaining we lose the chance to be God's tool of restoration. This is hard. This is like Christianity way up there, difficulty level stuff. To allow yourself to be the tool by which God redeems the people who hurt you. That is not easy. And that's the story of Job. That's why Job is in this example. Job is in this example because what God's asked Job to do is exceedingly hard and people have complained against him wrongly and yet God's purpose is to continue to redeem despite guilt. Despite guilt. James is saying you don't know who God will redeem. You don't know who God will forgive. You complain against your brother, yet God has a plan to redeem them and restore them and fix them. And if you're so busy complaining about them that you are bitter and you're angry and you're blinded, how are you going to be part of my 
plan to put them back together. So James has said, don't complain. The judge is at the door. Why do you fear that justice won't be done? Example number one, check out the prophets. Example number two, check out Job. They're difficult examples, but they're good examples that force us to really look at what God wants to do in the lives of people. And then he gives us a warning in verse 12. He says, Above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, that you may not fall under judgment. When I started preaching James many months ago, uh, one of the premises that I brought with me was that James is not haphazardly written, as some people might believe. I, I did not believe that it was kind of random pieces of advice stuck together that had to be taught individually. I started with the premise that James actually artfully and purposely put things together. And I got to this this week and I went, oof, really? This is hard. Until I really started thinking about that question I asked early on, why do we swear? Most of the time, why do we swear? What is our emotional place when we smear, swear? I'm going to uh, put up kind of the life cycle. Here's, here's these here. Remember we talked about? Here's the life cycle of a complaint. Very generalized. This didn't come from a book or anything. That was just me making things up, okay? So this didn't come from some fancy psychological book. I just came up with something. There's a complaint they wronged me. There's some sort of response to the accusation which could be remorse, remorse or denial or apathy, something. And then some sort of final reaction on the person who made the complaint which might be generalized as forgiveness or judgment. I suppose that there are other categories. I'm not trying to categorize everything. This isn't exhaustive. I'm just being general broad strokes here. I, I don't think that that's like way off weird funky. That's pretty general easy to understand stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna insert swearing into this scenario. So go to the next slide. This is the complaint life cycle when we add swearing. The complaint stays the same, they wronged me. But the response becomes, I swear I didn't do it or I swear it won't happen again. This is not helping. The, the I swear I didn't do it isn't, isn't a thoughtful contemplation of whether or not somebody may or may not actually have a real complaint against me. That's, that's not helpful. In fact, most of the time when there's some sort of conflict, whether we like it or not, there's generally something we can come back to and realize it was our problem. Almost always. Some sort of blanket, no, 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 it wasn't me, isn't a helpful part of the process. It doesn't make it better. We already talked about the dangers of saying, I swear it won't happen again. Good luck. It's a rash promise. But see, then when the final reaction comes in, I swear if this happens again or if I swear you will pay, what have we completely eliminated from the process now? We've eliminated God's potential for grace. We've eliminated restoration. We've eliminated forgiveness. We've eliminated the fact that sometimes God forgives and then forgives and then forgives again and then forgives again. And we've lost it now because in that final thing of I swear I'm never going to go through that again, we have closed the door. And our swearing, our passion in the middle of these negative circumstances where we're pushed to the edge where we want to make this firm, unmovable proclamation, if we're in the middle of a complaining issue, it isn't helping. <laughs> it's making it so much worse. It is amping the emotion. It is amping the consequences. It is pushing everything up to the highest level it can possibly get. It is the worst possible time that you could decide to swear something is in the middle of this conflict of a complaint that you're working through with someone else. Back away. 
Back away from the ultimatums. Back away from, from the, the absolutes. Back away from these statements of, of, no, I will never forgive you. Because these are often in our heart the real oaths we make. Inside, we make these O's of I will never forgive you. I will never forget. I will never get over this. I will never trust you again. And it doesn't matter whether it came out of our mouth or not. We swore it on the inside. We take the complaint and we take the issue and we take the conflict and we shove it into a place that isn't fixable it isn't fixable because we're unfixable. We're unmovable. We're unchangeable. We're too hard. We can't be cracked. The point that James is making about swearing could be generalized. There is nothing wrong with making a blanket statement about being careful about swearing, about letting our yes be yes and our no be no. That is a wonderfully good general principle. There is nothing wrong with taking that out of this. But very specifically, the situations in which we're most likely to speak an oath that we will regret are also the situations where doing so does the most damage. Absolute denials are seldom true and never helpful. Absolute guarantees that it won't happen again are laughably unrealistic. Absolute ultimatums are a good way to doom any relationship. An absolute judgment, well, the truth is we have no right. We have no right to a promise of vengeance or a promise of justice when we have been the recipients of grace. We have no business telling God that he can't grant grace to even those who have wronged us. And we see that both with the prophets and with Job. And the truth is we can become the immovable stone in the midst of God's compassion and mercy. Verse 11 says the, the outcomes of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful, which is often the last thing we want to hear when we have a complaint against somebody. The last thing we want to hear is that God might be compassionate or merciful to them. I'm reminded of the relationship between King Saul and and King David, how Saul vowed to destroy David and David refused to respond the same way. I look at David's life and I think that was a man who knew that the judge was at the door. If you read all the accounts of the times that he could have killed Saul, that he could have had his revenge against Saul, and yet every single time he said, no, that's the Lord's anointed, he will deal with his anointed in his time. And David was a man who got this. David was a man that despite somebody who he had every reason to complain about, because Saul was treating him so ugly. But David managed to hold on to the truth that this was God's business, not his business. I feel as if the application of this passage should be pretty obvious, but let's just pull it out in case. Application number one. If you feel tempted to complain against someone else, don't forget the judge is at the door. <laughs> God is not ignorant of how you have been wronged, nor he is unwilling or unable to act justly. Nor is he ignorant of the things that you've done wrong in that situation that you probably aren't thinking about or that you're unwilling to admit. He's aware of that stuff too. Number two, consider the prophets. Being who God has asked us to be, or speaking the words he has told us to speak may result in complaints against us, we still must remain faithful. We must still walk in faith that God will bring all things to their correct end. Number three, the example of Job. Even if we get entangled in complaints like Job and his friends endure, 
Stay true to God's word. Stand firm in your Savior. And be willing for God to show forgiveness and grace to everyone. And that may mean that he wishes to redeem people you don't even like through you. Last, let's watch what we say when emotion is highest. Let's guard ourselves from proclaiming vows. Because they are often promises we have no right to make or have no right to enforce. Lastly, if you're trying to figure out who Jesus is and what a relationship with him means, it is, it's actually all about this. Despite the mistakes that we've made and the mistakes others have made and all the silly stuff we have said and the hurtful things we've been a part of, despite the fact that God has every reason to have a complaint against us, as we read in verse 11, he is full of compassion and mercy. God is able to cut through guilt and shame and judgment and anger and vengeance and remorse, all of it. He cuts through it and offers restoration and peace and power and hope. God offers an answer no one else can offer in the midst of guilt, in the midst of a valid complaint. God somehow is still able to answer with love. And that's the offer of Christianity. As children of God made in his image, Let's be a conduit of that grace to everyone. I'm going to pray, but what, what my thought is for communion, and I'll bring the communion table out. I've always been taught that there are some good reasons not to take communion, and I'm not trying to get in the weeds, but one of the reasons I was taught not to take communion is if there was something serious between you and another brother and sister in Christ, if, if, you, were, if you were at odds with each other, I was taught, you know what, just, just leave it, be there. And fix that thing before you go to the table. I was taught that. We've been talking about complaints against each other. Before we come to the table, let's just be sure that we've taken any complaint we have against anyone else to the Lord. If we need to take it to somebody else, then we need to take it to somebody else. Let's just, let's just be certain that we don't have... a stumbling block between each other that shouldn't be there before we come to the table because we've been talking about complaining. But let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's easy to get frustrated. It's especially easy to get frustrated with people who have actually done wrong things. Lord, the truth is we're always surrounded by people who do wrong things because people do wrong things. Yet in you we have this incredible example of forgiveness and restoration. Lord, would you help me to be a person who forgives people? Would you help me to be a person who watches my tongue, watches my mouth, when I'm in the most difficult of circumstances. God, what I say that I wouldn't say things that would make it worse. Would you make us a church that loves each other so much that we would not complain about each other? We would know that we sometimes have to confront one another. But we're all more than willing to, like Job, be the path, be the way that somebody else can be restored. And our own ego can take a back seat. Whatever it takes for you to restore others, our pride isn't an issue. We can let that go. Thank you, Lord, for communion and, and the essence of that symbol. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to bring up the table. You can come up when you're ready and just hold on to the elements. And we'll uh, pray and take together at the end.